morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here with Manny, who I've known for several years. Um, I used to be the small business editor at the Globe and Mail and got to know the community really well uh, and even started a business that was related to the community and so Manny and I have kept in touch over the years and when he's in Toronto we get together and talk all things startups and uh, all the amazing things that he's doing in his world and so we're going to take a half an hour or so to chat about that this morning. So uh, Manny, uh, maybe let's start just by um, having you talk a little bit about yourself. You had a short intro there but maybe um, you know, kind of talk about some of the work that you do on sort of a day-by-day, week-to-week basis. Absolutely. So uh, my, my background actually is, is a little bit unique that I don't come from the finance field. Uh, I started an executive search. So I started finding people, which as a lot of people in the room will now realize, people are the key to business, not just the numbers. And so I left about eight years ago to start my own executive search firm. And how I got into the angel investing space was I started placing CEOs and board directors and thought, instead of taking cash, why don't I take stock? And so I started taking stock and equity in a number of companies. And I built that off into New Avenue Capital. So New Avenue Capital focuses on three groups. We focus on financial, human, and impact capital. On the financial side, we do early stage investing. We've got uh, investments in about six countries globally, about 40 to 50 private companies, and about 15 public companies. Uh, We also have the Human Capital Division, which focuses still on executive search, but mainly only for the companies we've now invested in. And we typically do that for options, so we don't lose cash out of the businesses. And then the passionate side for me is New Avenue Capital's Impact Division. Uh, We've got a goal of kids' education. I come from a small town, immigrant family out of India, and I've really realized the key is education, not just university, but a variety of education tools and methods. And so I've got a goal by the time I turn 40, and our group does of educating a million kids, and we're doing that through various investments in social impact companies, typical donations, and uh, time as well for companies. Great. Um, So let's... This one's not working. So I'll just take this off. Stick with the handheld. Um, Let's talk about trends. So VCs, angels, they're always looking for just great companies generally to invest in, but oftentimes there are certain sectors in which they're more interested than others. So what are you seeing from a trends perspective in terms of investment from the VC and angel community? What types of companies are they looking at these days for the most part? The ones that I'm seeing, and and typically for us that we're we're looking more at, and the advanced or experienced angels are more the B2B side businesses at this point. Uh, artificial intelligence, you know, I joke around right now, you know, the hottest trend is if you could start a company that says we're a crypto cannabis blockchain mining corp, you would instantly be worth at least $100 million, maybe two, depending on where you are in the cycle. But, um, you know, the key is really to hit on the trends that aren't just cycling up and down. Like, I always talk about value and making sure you have the right value and trends. So would I invest in crypto or blockchain? Well, I see blockchain as revolutionary, and I see it in the background kind of building up on different bases at a large term scale. Whereas when I look at crypto, I still see the fluctuations and the volatility, and I go, not sure where this is going to be. It's somewhere in the universe and somewhere in the product. So where I'm seeing VC firms tend is more the safer side still, B2B, artificial intelligence. As an angel investor, I get to be risky. I enjoy that. That's part of my job. This is, this is gambling, but doesn't look like it, right? If you think about it. Uh, so I, we're looking at more of the, the crypto, blockchain, uh, those type of spaces to, to keep growing and keep building from. Do you own any crypto? I own zero crypto. However, and the reason for that is, however, I am an investor in multiple companies that are liquid, which are public, that work in crypto. I'm a big believer in liquidity. So if I'm going to go into a business that's illiquid with a private company, such as the companies that are here, I want companies that have exponential abilities and have an ability to grow 10, 20, 50, 100 times. I don't know if crypto companies have that ability anymore because it seems as though they've already grown 10, 20, 50 times in the last six months. So I would rather take that in the public markets. I'd rather trade in that space than, than have that private. Okay, so in terms of investing, uh, a lot of angels and VCs talk about how they're investing as much in the founder as they are in the idea that the founder has come up with or the company that mm-hmm. the founder is trying to build. Do you subscribe to that philosophy? And, and if so, um, what is it in terms of qualities that you look for in a founder? The entire key part of a business is, is the people behind it. And, and there's two reasons for that. The, the company that I'm investing at, let's say at a pre-5 million valuation, for example, is definitely not the company they're going to build. 
and more than likely will not be the company that they exit. So I've had about 22 exits in my portfolio so far in the last eight years on the private angel investing side. And I can state clearly that none of the companies that exited look the exact same or even close somewhat to when I first wrote a check into the organizations. And entrepreneurs and the ones that I'm investing in recognize that. They have that level of coachability and flexibility, that tolerance for ambiguity that you're looking for. You're in a startup stage. Right? When we're looking at businesses, when you're looking at starting your business, you're working in a space sometimes where no one else has worked, or if you're borrowing an idea, we'll call it, and putting a twist on it, you have to grow into that business. So you need to have a higher tolerance for ambiguity than the regular person, than the average individual to grow it. Uh, so we're looking for coachability, credibility in terms of being consistent in what you're saying, and then we have to have that belief, and me specifically, I have to have that belief that you are the one that can lead that business going forward. Because you can have the greatest idea in the world, but if you can't explain it, it doesn't matter. One of, the, one of the biggest things I always say as an angel investor is when I'm hearing a presentation, I always say, explain it to me like I'm in fifth grade. Okay? Part of that is I want them to think I'm in fifth grade and treat me like that. That's great. But the second reason for that is if you can't explain your business to me in 20 seconds, then I don't understand what your business does, and that means neither do you. Right? If I can't explain it to my five-year-old, although we'll take a little bit longer with him, then it means that the business isn't fully vetted yet, or you're not even understanding where you're going. So that's, that's a key and critical element. So let's say over the past five years, if we're going to use a time period, um, have you seen the average profile of founders changing? In other words, have you seen ages change? Have you seen gender changes? Have you seen education levels changing? Like, are, are founders, in terms of their profile, different now than they were a few years ago, given the, the sort of tech boom that we've seen in the past few years? Diversity, for sure. So I'm seeing uh, founders who are much younger, who have decided to forego the university route. A lot of them have talked to me about that, that they've decided to skip it. And also older entrepreneurs which I think are, are seeing a second wave. There's, there's a couple we just invested in who four or five years ago told me they never would have done this, but now they're seeing the tools and resources built out. They felt comfortable in some capacity they can build. So that, that generation gap is kind of disappearing, uh, which is great, because I think having that wide base of entrepreneurs just gets more ideas out into the universe, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for great ideas, some fail fast, and pivot into other things very quickly. The diversity angle is interesting because I've sat on a few panels uh, talking about female entrepreneurs and how we need to support female entrepreneurs because it's the right thing to do, because they need our help, etc. Female entrepreneurs kick ass. I, I will typically say that the female entrepreneurs I invest in, I remember getting up on stage one time and telling them, I don't invest in female entrepreneurs because it's a not-for-profit because then I would just donate my money. I invest in female entrepreneurs because the ones in my portfolio are kicking ass. They typically do more with less money. They're much more humble, and they're much more realistic on certain goals and targets. And when my analysts go back and we actually map it out compared to what is said versus what's actually done, they're a lot more on target than, unfortunately, some of my male counterparts. <laughs> so I think just having this this diversity happening with the younger individuals, older individuals coming into the space along with more female entrepreneurs is just going to breed better ideas. So you and I were chatting beforehand. Um, I know you're getting somewhat interested now in investing in Latin American companies, um, that you're starting to make some forays into that particular region. So what, what would you say is the general perception of Canadian investors when it comes to Latin American startups? Um, what is the, the sort of favorability ranking of them? What is it that people find interesting? And um, you know, is, there, is there increasing interest on the part of Canadian investors to put some money into those Latin American companies? The first thing I'd say is it, it depends on the type of angel investor you're dealing with. Uh, a lot of investors, angel investors specifically, stay localized to their geographies. So typically, if it's a Toronto angel, they'll stay within the Ontario region. If it's a, if it's a Vancouver angel, if we don't think Toronto is the center of the universe, then we stay in Vancouver. Uh, it really depends. Uh, my portfolio is a little different because of my search business where I came from. I was working globally, and so that's why I've got portfolios, you know, about six different countries. And so for, for us as an investor, and maybe a little bit more mature stage here, uh, we're looking always where we see value. And I typically six, seven years ago was not investing in Canada because I found companies here were overvalued. And so I was investing in Singapore, in London, in the US, not Silicon Valley, but other areas. 
I came back to Canada about four or five years ago because I saw the market was correcting itself and we were seeing value in terms of the investments that we're putting in. I've got no issues with paying founders a valuation on their perceived business, but when someone comes to me with a safe that has a no cap and 10% discount, for example, I'm not really interested in, in their company. Uh, and so we're always looking for regions. So what I, what I have found looking in South America, and we've been doing a lot of research and looking at different countries, is that um, a lot of South American companies seem to get to revenue faster, seem to produce and pivot less, and are more shooting than aiming, which is what you want to see. When you're, when you're looking at businesses early stages, you're looking to test and try as much as possible. And so that's what's piqued our interest, myself and, and another group of investors that we work with, to take a look into those regions. We're still looking at how to structure, whether we invest in those countries or have a Canadian corp set up, et cetera. But, uh, but that's our first foray, and over the next year to two, we're, we're planning on putting a few million dollars into the region. So which countries are you looking at specifically right now, and uh, why did you choose those? There's 10 here right now, and I don't offend anybody. But uh, um, the ones that I know that have reached out that we're starting to talk with more are, are Colombia, Chile, and Brazil. And so I'd love to talk to the other, other seven countries here as well uh, to see. And what we're looking for, and I think those three countries that we started with, is there seems to be... Um, some push into North America of some of the companies I'm seeing, at least from my perspective. So I've seen those businesses starting to expand into Canada, into the U.S. or into Europe, looking at markets outside of South America. And that's the biggest key is I'm looking for companies that are going to think exponentially. Right? They're, they're thinking outside their own groups. You know, uh, the MP said it quite well. You know, for him, when he first started, Toronto would have been amazing if he could build it. I find that from a lot of Canadian entrepreneurs. And I'm seeing that from other entrepreneurs in countries. They just focus on that one country. But use your country as a test to scale other places and, and to grow. And, and typically, that helps a lot, a lot well. And so tactically, how would you make those forays? Would you, you know, like make partnerships of some sort in order to sort of work your way into the region and learn about it? Or would you go on your own? Or how, how would that work? Well, I think partnerships are key. Uh, you know, we're looking, and one of the reasons I was here, and Miriam's been very kind to have me here for, for a few years, so we've built some relationships with individuals in those countries. But uh, I like to be the least uh, the, the least smart person in the room, so I'd like to have smarter people around me. That's typically the best way to invest, is to is to be the is to be smart money, but not the smartest. Uh, and so we're working there. I'm also part of an organization called EO Entrepreneurs Organization, and we've got chapters all over the world. So I tend to reach out to my uh, my fellow colleagues in EO globally to see where to where to touch down. But I've heard uh, and I've seen great things from from a lot of the uh, the incubators, accelerators, and individuals that LATAM has introduced us to. That gives us that opportunity now that in the fall this year and in the spring, we're going to be making a, a trip down there to to be writing some checks. Okay, and if you're a Canadian investor who doesn't speak Spanish or Portuguese, is that a barrier, um, or do you think that's something that's easily overcome? Do you see it as an issue? I don't see it as an issue specifically. Uh, for me, I think you need to know both languages if you're going to be coming out to different countries and regions. So it really depends on the company and the project. Uh, to me, communication is going to be the key probably in English if you're going to come into the North America or European side. Uh, it really depends what your business is. If it's a business focused in South America and it's, it's going to be there and you control scalability, I will find a translator. <laughs> Everyone can translate 10 times X, DS, X, correct? Right? I'm happy to see returns and also happy to work with great entrepreneurs and people. Right? One of the points of me working in this space and why I angel invest is I want to work with amazing people. Right? Education is key for me, not just for myself in terms of education, but for entrepreneurs that we're seeing and we're building. Because if you find successful entrepreneurs and you build them out in any country, they're going to go out and then have an influence positively. So for me, whether it's Spanish, I'll learn Spanish if I need to. Right? I'm, I didn't get four years like the previous MP did in, uh, in, in university, but I got one or two. And I speak three other languages, so I can, I can pick it up pretty quickly. Okay, so for uh, companies that are based in Latin America and want to penetrate the North American market, what do you think some of the, the more um, pressing hurdles for them would be? What are going to be some of the difficulties they might encounter that a Canadian investor might be able to help them with? You know, the, f the first advice I would give for any companies that are coming up here is to get attached into an incubator accelerator of some sort. And the key for that is the one disadvantage you have compared to others is relationships and contacts. And the best way to solve those 
is to get connected with individuals who know the ecosystem uh, to be able to to be able to hit those contacts as well. Um, I have a personal rule that the only way we look at a business is if it gets referred into us. And so we see over 1,500 pitch decks get emailed into us a year. We look at about 400 or so because those are the ones that are referred into us by someone we trust. And a lot more individuals are moving to that model just because it's an easy way of filtering. It's like a GPA to get to university. It may not be the best indicator of success in university, but it's a way to whittle down the pile a little bit and to get to more credible pieces. So if you're able to connect with the right individuals in the regions you're going to be working in, that will help you move faster and raise your capital. And then the second thing is going to be, you know, we're still looking at methods of whether we should write a check into the countries or setting up a second company in Canada or the US. If you're serious about coming out to these regions, sometimes you're going to have to set up those second corporations. So getting the right tax and legal advice, I was just sitting with a lawyer who does work, um, I think it's FCR Law, who does work both sides. To have those structure, structural issues figured out at the very beginning is going to be key. Uh, as you're going to grow, because that's the first thing I look for. If I see disorganization in, in companies on the administration side, I don't think you can run your business because you're going to be spending all your time over there. So having those two pieces, a network, relationship, contacts, through an incubator accelerator, and then getting the structure correctly set up so that way you can talk to angels out here. So on the flip side, what about Canadian companies that want to do business in Latin America? Have you seen much of that? I mean, Canadians are often notoriously gun-shy about expanding. You know, they often look to the U.S. to start, but um, obviously there are other markets and, and other opportunities. So are you seeing Canadian companies taking advantage of the opportunities that are in the markets in Latin America? And if so, what do you think is appealing about that particular region? You know, I think the South American companies have one advantage, and that is language coming from there um, in terms of a barrier to entry. So what I've seen typically with a lot of companies in Canada, if you're in Toronto, typically you're looking at the U.S. and then Europe. If you're in Vancouver, you're looking at the U.S. and Asia. And it's a very uh, single-track mindset. Uh, you know, that's just the model people follow. And so there's been a nice barrier to entry for yourselves, South American companies, because we're not tapping those markets as well yet, nor is there the understanding of the cultural nuances that come in all the multiple countries. A lot of people in Canada, a lot of people in the U.S. think, you know, it's all the same, which if you've been to the regions and know it's definitely not, right? Every, every culture, everything is different. And so uh, that barrier to entry has been very helpful. I think it's going to start to diminish more and more, especially as we're getting more entrepreneurs from those countries coming to Canada, skipping the U.S. for reasons we all know. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's a key that's a key piece that you're going to see, and it's going to cause more companies coming into those regions. But that's going to be due to the fact that they have local knowledge. But at this point, right now, out of the 40 to 50 companies we have private, not one is working in South America. Interesting. So let's say you're a company that is planning to make that expansion. You're ready to make that leap. Strategically, what type of advice would you give um, to a company in that position, like a Canadian company that was planning to go down there? How would you help them do that? The biggest piece there is going to be the culture piece to me, right? Understanding how, how the countries work and not having a gunshot approach. Or, or sorry, shotgun approach into multiple multiple areas. You're going to have to focus on one country and understand how, whether your product works there or not. I was just talking with uh, with a colleague at my table here about one of the companies I'm invested in, Care Crew, that does dentist office software. And he was talking about in Brazil, there's probably a need for that because there's 40 million people who are under the healthcare coverage system that are eligible for private insurance, if I'm correct. Um, and so for them to foray into there, you know, for me, uh, that market seems to be a well-ripened market. So my first introduction is going to be that founder to that individual uh, to understand and get into that market and get local, local support. Understanding that you need to have an intimate knowledge of what's happening there if you're going to test. As a startup, you have a burn rate, right? And you need to determine where that burn rate's going to go. So the more testing you can do for a quality price, the better it is. So having that local knowledge and bringing people on staff are to assist with that. And now with you know, Upwork, you see all these different types of systems you can use. You can connect with people everywhere and get very good knowledge and information right away. So you mentioned the US. Um, the political situation down there is obviously changed. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> we won't mention anybody by name. 
any specific individuals, at least, anyways. I still have to travel to the U.S. So. <laughs> um, let's just talk generally yes. about how there's a lot of discussion around changing mindsets. In other words, um, companies being a bit more gun shy about making forays into the U.S. as a result of um, political difficulties, shall we say, and probably particularly around NAFTA and, and some of the uncertainties around it. So, how would you? approach a company that was thinking about going to the US but there was an opportunity to maybe go to Latin America instead like would you would you kind of counsel them to maybe avoid that particular expansion in favor of one that's a little bit further south or do you think it doesn't really matter um, you know despite what we're seeing in regards to a company selling a product in the United States I think that's totally fine what I think instead we should be focusing on, and it's not whoever's in charge there or whatever's happening, it's more the fact that it's divisive and it's changing of a culture, right? America used to be a culture that was focused on immigration, bringing the best people in. That's what Canada should be focusing on, and then vice versa in South America, that's what countries there should be focusing on. If there's a brain drain happening in the US of smart people who are looking to position themselves somewhere in the world, Whichever country it is should be focused on attracting those people. Because I said at the very beginning, I came from a people business. And so do many people here now when they're looking at entrepreneurs and startups. Give me a seasoned, smart individual any time of the day over a product because that individual is going to think of multiple businesses. And so the focus shouldn't be as much, like I said, on who's in charge, etc. If you're selling a product in that space, that's great. You should go wherever your product makes the most sense. But in terms of getting the right talent and the right people, now has not been a better time than ever to attract some very well-skilled individuals, specifically technical people, because there is a shortage of strong technical CTO-type founders. I always say there's a hipster, a hustler, and a hacker. That's the hacker part. And those are becoming less in supply and are coming more in demand. And so those are the, that's the one country that you can look at where people may, take a, may think of leaving at this point and looking at something new. And so take advantage of that. That would, be, that would be my advice. So a lot of Canadian VCs or angels like to partner with angels or VCs from other countries when they're investing in those other countries. So how do you feel about partnering with other VCs or angels on deals? Or do you generally like to go in on your own, or do you see yourself wanting to partner if, let's say, you wanted to invest in some companies down in Latin America? Every deal I do is syndicated. Every single deal that we do is syndicated with a group of investors. And the reason for that is we're spreading the risk, but we're also reducing. You know, to me, an angel investor, what we typically are there to do is to reduce risk and reduce ambiguity. And so for me, I'm in there and I'm chatting with the people. I'm looking at the companies, I'm looking at the individuals saying, does this idea make sense and do the people make sense? Then typically, just based on my network and the business I came from, I find a couple people who are industry experts to see if they'll write a check into the business. And then I've got a tech team that, I, that I've, I'm an investor in that can stress test the tech for me to make sure that the tech actually works and, and the pieces are there. And typically that individual will write a check as well, one of those teams. So typically you're seeing if I'm writing a check into a deal, there's probably two to four other individuals who are coming with me on that deal. And everyone brings something to the business. The goal is to bring individuals who can assist, whether it's industry expertise, people expertise or technology expertise. And that's typically how we syndicate it. And I've got syndications with individuals globally. Um, so I've got a WhatsApp group uh, from, from my classmates when I studied at Harvard, which probably has the best workflow in terms of deals and opportunities. And so we invest co into a variety of deals globally. And so what do you think about accelerator and incubator programs? Do you think those are good breeding grounds for growth-minded entrepreneurs? And do you look at those more closely than you would at companies, say, that haven't been through one of those processes? Yes and no. I, I think an accelerator and incubator is a great place to start. However, I think you need to vet the ones that you're getting into. right? And they are not the holy grail. They're just a starting point. Right? So when you're getting into an incubator accelerator, see who your mentors are, see what businesses you're building and developing. But your goal is to take that as a launch pad to look at other places that you can go. Angel investors, people who are writing you your checks, other individuals from businesses that make the most sense that you've been involved with, industry, you need to look at those things. I, I've seen a lot of accelerators, incubators coming up, and sometimes I can't differentiate between accelerator and a co-working space. 
right? Just because you worked in an office does not mean that that office is the one that helped you grow and now they say we raised X millions of dollars. No, no, no. You were working in a space. An incubator and accelerator, a proper one to me, is where there's mentors who have built businesses, who have expertise practically, not theoretically, and who are able to help you and give you some life lessons to learn and grow. So be very careful when you're judging an incubator accelerator versus a co-working space. And try to get into those incubator accelerators as much as you can, the ones that are solid and can help you move forward. Because once again, as you'll hear me say this, your whole job is to reduce the risk of your project. You can't guarantee 100% success, but you can reduce risk and reduce ambiguity. And so getting into a, a proper incubator accelerator will be one of those steps that can assist. And so what do you think about companies or founders from one country going into an accelerator in another country that interests them? Like, do you see that as being a smart way to kind of make a move into a region where you want to start doing business? Yeah, as, as I already mentioned, I think it's the one way that you can build a contact and relationships quite quickly. If you can end up at Mars here, uh, you know, I'm from Vancouver, and this is typically where I come for every single deal. I contact the Mars individual who's here, say any cool companies you have. I talk to Miriam, see if there's any business from LATAM. Talk to NACO, because they're based here. Class Capital's here. Airbnb is here. You know, there's a hub here, right? You got the DMZ as well. There's, there's certain hubs that you can find very quickly that allow you to access a lot of pieces. And so being here is, is a great place to start. And being at a conference like this is, is a great place to learn. Accelerators tend to focus very much on pitching, like almost exclusively. Uh, incubators do as well. How important, you, you mentioned the pitch kind of earlier on in the, in the conversation, but how important do you think the pitch is when it comes to accessing capital? Is it the be all and end all? Is it the most important thing? Or is there too much of a focus on that to the dearth of other skill sets that you need to build up? I think as when you're when you're focused on pitching, and a lot of the accelerators, if you talk about Y Combinator, or 500 startups, or TechStars, all, all these all these incubators, their focus is really to get you set to pitch to a VC firm or or angels. For me, and I know a lot, number of other angels. Most entrepreneurs come to me for advice, and then they get a check. And, and the reason for that is I'm not expecting that an entrepreneur is going to know everything. If you walk into a room and you're the perfect pitch with the best business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those don't come around all the time. Typically what I see is a first-time entrepreneur who's coming in and says, here's my business, here's my market, here's my strategy. They may not be the best at pitching, but they can convey the business. And to me, that's key. I'm not worried about excellent presentation skills. Those can be taught. However, certain skill sets of your business, how you convey your message to your business, do you, do you come across authentic, incredible, those are the pieces that I'm looking at. And then as we grow, if you're a technical co-founder, for example, your presentation skills might not be solid. But then you're probably going to bring in a, someone to come help you who might be your business development person or who might come in as a CEO. Right? We, you never have to be running your entire business. And so you always want to make sure that uh, that works out. The angels or the VC firms that look at the perfect pitch, to me, that's not the best model to be confirming it. I want to see the business, and then I want to see if they can convey the business, and then we can help them with their pitch. Okay, so one last question before we wrap up, because I think that uh, <laughs> I feel a presence to my right that's saying to wrap this up. The clock still says three minutes. I know, We're good. This has been great. We're good. Yeah. Um, what would your one piece of advice be to uh, startups in the room that might be interested in talking to you about a potential investment? Talk to Miriam. Everyone has her email address, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Miriam's like, great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, the businesses I'm looking at, so the one key thing you always want to talk to is an angel who knows what, they're, what they want. If you say, send me everything, that means we're not key. I focus on B2B businesses, uh, so not B2C. Uh, I like B2B businesses. If it's angel investment, pre-5 million valuation, I prefer equity. I won't look at a safe, typically, or a convertible note unless there's a cap in it. <laughs> Thank you.